Yeah, good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Everyone doing okay? Man, it's good to see you all. You all look amazing. I want you to imagine, if you would, uh, having to follow up when the lead pastor comes up and say his tumor was miraculously healed. Now here, hey, it's me, youth pastor. Um, but uh, anyway, we're going to go. We're going to give it a shot. And uh, make sure uh, you go and give Pastor Hug, or Pastor Hug, Pastor Scott a hug. I don't know if he likes hugs. Give him one anyway. This is a good day. We can celebrate with him. All right? Um, so we're going through this series uh, on the Apostles' Creed. And our hope is that if we take a, a closer look at Creed, um, that we really hope this series will take you higher to an understanding of who God is. We hope you hear these words with arms wide open and that maybe they help you escape my own prison. Maybe even help you understand what's this life for. Any Creed fans in the house? Did you catch those? All right, yep, I see, I see that hand. I see that hand. Yeah. Anyway, uh, if you were here last week, uh, we kicked off this series and Pastor Scott talked about the first line of the Apostles' Creed, which says this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, if you weren't here last week, I highly encourage you to go back and check out that sermon, Ward.Church. You can see our past sermons. And really, that, that first sermon kind of, the first statement of the creed uh, kind of covers over everything that comes after it. It all begins with God being the Father Almighty. So if you weren't able to see that, I really invite you to go back and see that. And uh, now, as Pastor Scott shared last week, the Apostles' Creed is not scripture. It shouldn't be regarded as scripture. But what it is, is it's a statement of faith, kind of summing up our faith as it's laid out by the apostles and the disciples in the New Testament. It's a statement of, of what we as Christians believe. So today, we're going to be looking at the second line of the Apostles' Creed, that we talked about God the Father in the first week, and now the Apostles' Creed turns its attention towards God's Son. And we see these words, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Now at first glance, you kind of look at that, and if you grew up in church, or if you've been a Christian your whole life, you look at that and say, yeah, amen. But I want to, if we can, just for a minute, can we just pretend that you've never heard that statement before. Can we pretend that maybe this morning you're hearing about Jesus Christ for the very first time? Can we do that? Because when we look at this statement after that, I mean, the first part of the creed, God being the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, that's not all that different from what a lot of people who believe in a divine being believe. To say that God is our king, king over this world and the things beyond, is not all that crazy for a religion to claim. But this next part that talks about God, creator of all things above and below the world, this next part where we talk about how God had a son. And not only did God have a son, but God sent his son here to earth as, as an atonement for our sins. He, he took on human form, and not only that, he did so with the sole purpose in mind of dying a torturous death for our sins. Can we all just take a minute and think, man, that's kind of weird, right? Like to think about a divine being, a king, having a son. That son taking on human form and suffering and dying for our sins. Can we just admit that's a little strange? But yet it's a cornerstone of our faith. It's basically what almost all of our faith hinges on, Jesus Christ and the life he lived and the death he died and then the resurrection. That's kind of a cornerstone of our faith. So today, we're going to be diving a little bit more into what it means that Jesus Christ was God's son. And, and not only was he God's son, but he says he and the Father are one. So he is, in very nature, fully God, fully human. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And before we do, i got to give a quick plug. Uh, if you've never joined a small group here at Ward, it's not too late to jump into a small group right now. And in the small groups, they're going to be kind of taking what's preached on up here in Sundays and kind of unpacking it a little bit more. So if you hear some of these things and you're wondering, that doesn't really make sense to me and you'd like to have a further conversation about any of this, small groups are the perfect place 
to do that. I don't think it's too late to join a group. Is it too late? Uh, no, it's not too late. No, it's not too late, Sarah says. Go ahead, join a group. So when you walk out of the auditorium this morning, turn right, and you'll find our Connection Center, and they can help you with that. Highly encourage you to do so. Okay, now let's start with the name Jesus Christ. Because if we want to fully understand who Jesus was, let's start here with where that name comes from. Now in the New Testament, which was originally penned in Greek, we hear this word, uh, the, the word we get Christ from, that word is Christos. Everyone say Christos. Christos. Yeah, and where that word comes from, it actually comes from a Hebrew word in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament, or the first section of the Bible, the first big section, that was originally penned in Hebrew, and that word for Christos literally translated means anointed one. So Christ comes from Christos. Christos comes from a Hebrew word meaning anointed one. Are y'all still with me? You just nod your heads, bro, so I know. You know, you're, oh, yeah, I'm still with That's what I make the teenagers do. I'm like, are y'all with me? And they're like, no, and I'm like, just nod your head so I know you're with me. Okay, anyway, so in the Old Testament, and uh, literally in the people of Israel, which were God's chosen people, and the Old Testament is kind of the story about the people of Israel and how that all unfolds. And in, in that kingdom of Israel, there were basically three anointed roles. So we see that Jesus Christ's name means anointed one. And there were actually three anointed roles in the kingdom of Israel. And each of these roles were meant for someone to serve who was set apart. Someone who was not voted on or anything like that, but someone who was chosen by God and anointed by God to be in the role that they were in. And also, each of these three roles were a foreshadowing of what was to come in Jesus Christ, who was the perfect embodiment of these three anointed roles. And those three roles were this, prophet, priest, and king. So these were the three roles that were anointed in the kingdom of Israel, and also the three roles that Jesus Christ embodies for us when he came here to earth. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one is this, Jesus, our prophet, or the prophet. If you're taking notes this morning, this is a great place to start. Jesus Christ is our prophet. So to understand that role, that anointed role, we need to really understand what a prophet was. See, prophets in the Old Testament were basically, in the simplest term, they were sent by God to reveal God's word to God's people. So they would, they would relay God's messages to the people of Israel. There's a little bigger definition in the book of Deuteronomy, and it says this about prophets. This is God speaking, giving his word. He says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. Don't miss that there. I will put my words in his mouth. Because remember, prophets were relaying God's messages to God's people. He will tell them everything I command him. And then it continues here. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. So, so you're starting to get that a little bit. Prophets were delivering, they were God's messengers to God's people. Whenever he wanted to speak to them, he would use prophets to go to them. Prophets were, were known as people who would drive people away from sin and bring them back to God. In fact, this is our oldest son, Micah. We named him Micah, and sometimes people ask us why we named him that. And it was actually after one of the Old Testament prophets, whose name was Micah. And in Micah's book, you see him delivering these prophetic messages. Sometimes it was a message of judgment. Sometimes it was a message of hope. But it was always a message that was directing God's people back to God. And our hope and prayer for our son Micah was that he would do that same thing with his life. That he would be an encouragement to those around him. And that he would bring people to Jesus. So, actually our youngest two are prophets too. Elijah and Ezra. Almost forgot about them. They're here too. They're cool. Um, but anyway, probably the greatest and most well-known Old Testament prophet was Moses. And Moses promised that one day a prophet even greater than him 
would come. And this happens in the book of Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 22. It says, For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. So it's kind of calling back to that passage in Deuteronomy, right? A prophet from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. And it continues. It says, Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. So even when we saw these prophets in the Old Testament, all of them were pointing towards something greater. All of them were a foreshadowing of the greatest prophet that would ever be or would ever come. There's an Old Testament scholar, his name is Gerard von Rad. I don't know if it's pronounced rad, but I like to pronounce it rad because I figure he's probably a rad guy, you know? He's probably a pretty good dude. So he says that the phrase, the word of God, appears 241 times in the Old Testament. And of those 241 times in the Old Testament, again, before Jesus came, right? 221 of them were from the lips of prophets as they declared a revelation from God. So what does this have to do with Jesus? Because then Jesus came, right? In the New Testament, Matthew, we hear the story of how Jesus came to us, and in John as well. And when Jesus came as a prophet, this time it was a little different. All the prophets before would speak by God's authority, right? We said, of all the times in the Old Testament, they would always speak from God's authority. But Jesus spoke from his own authority. Because he was, in fact, God. Him and the Father are one, right? Right? Jesus would say things like, this is what the Lord says, and then tell them what he was saying as their Lord. He would say things like, I say to you, claiming himself as the source of truth and authority. In Mark chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it says, Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum, and when the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. And the people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority quite unlike the teachers of the religious law. As our great prophet, Jesus came to preach. And is the greatest preacher who ever has or ever will preach. Jesus preaches unto us messages of truth. And he always calls us to repent of our sin and turn away from our sin and turn back to God as our prophet. And he doesn't point out our sin or, or tell us that from a perspective of shame or guilt because Jesus doesn't really deal with shame or guilt. He operates in grace and truth. You see, by leaning on us, by showing us the sin in our lives and pointing us towards something better, something higher, through his Holy Spirit, Jesus is not showing hate to us. He's actually showing a great love to us because he knows that we can have a better life. He knows following God is the best life we could possibly live. So just like Old Testament prophets leaned on Israel because they knew, they knew Israel would be better off if they were following God, Jesus does that same thing for us because he knows the best life we can have to be fully alive is to run from sin and towards God the Father. He came to be our very own personal prophet to teach us what sin is, help us turn away from sin, and guide us to turn towards God. But not only that, not only was Jesus our prophet, he also came to be our great high priest. So what does that mean? Well, in the Old Testament, another anointed role was the priest. And the priest was kind of a mediator between God and man. See, in the Old Testament... God was so holy, so anointed, that people couldn't actually come into the presence of God or they'd be so overwhelmed by his presence. So what they did is they had priests, and priests were mediators between man and God. If someone, if someone had committed a sin and they wanted to atone for those sins, they would go and talk to their priest. And not only that, they would bring a sacrifice, and it was the priest's role to actually perform the sacrifice. Because in the Old Testament, with, without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. So the priest kind of mediated all that stuff for the people of Israel. They were the mediator between God and man. And in the book of Hebrews, we are told that Jesus came to earth to be our great high priest. 
Check this out. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace. Remember, again, not condemnation and judgment, but mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And that's from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. When Jesus came to earth, he fulfilled that anointed role of priest in our lives. He came to to make a way that now we don't have to go to a temple and offer a sacrifice to hear from God. No, we can go to God any time we want to. We can approach the throne of God with confidence, knowing that Jesus has made a way for us to do so. And I know like these days, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal because we pray all the time, right? And we, we might not really think about the fact that we're approaching God the Father's throne. But people in the Old Testament... If they would have heard that it's that simple, that in any time of day we can bow our heads and and approach the throne of God, their minds would have been blown. I don't really think they would have been able to comprehend what that means, that just at any point throughout the day, because of what Jesus did, we can go to the throne of God and lay all of our struggles at his feet, all of our fears at his feet. And it's all because of Jesus, our great high priest, who made a way for us, who made the ultimate sacrifice. See, he was, you hear this word, maybe if you've been to church before, you may hear one of the names of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Well, the reason is because when Jesus came, again, up to that point, in order to have forgiveness of sins, you'd need a sacrifice. But Jesus came as the pure, spotless, perfect Lamb. And when Jesus Christ was sacrificed on that cross, it was for the atonement of not only sins that had been committed, but sins that would be committed from that day forward. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for us. The book of Hebrews shows us that Jesus' ministry as our priest did not end with his ascension into heaven, but that Jesus is daily, daily intercessing on our behalf to God the Father. Meaning right now in this moment... Jesus is bringing our concerns, our fears, our ailments to God the Father. He is praying for us as we speak. That's pretty cool, right? This means Jesus knows us. He loves us. He pays attention to us. And he cares for us. And it's not because our lives are particularly exciting. I don't think he's watching us waiting. Oh, I wonder what Mark does next. You know? It's because he's our great high priest who is lovingly concerned for us and lifting us up to God the Father, intercessing to God the Father on our behalf. When we understand Jesus as our priest, we're able to know that he loves us affectionately, tenderly, and personally. And we can also see Jesus' desires for us in our lives is that we live with joy, constantly doing what we can to love God and love people. So we see Jesus as our prophet. We see him as our great high priest. There's one more anointed role in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled when he came here to earth. And that is he also came to be our king. Check this out in the book of John chapter 18. John writes this. Writing Jesus' words, right? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom... If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. This is when Jesus was on trial before his execution. And then Pilate said, so you are a king? Asking him that question. And look at Jesus' response. He says, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. Jesus taught that his kingdom was so much bigger than what people could think of in their minds at that time. See, at the time Jesus came, the world was ruled by kings. Kings and kingdoms. So then Jesus comes proclaiming he's a king. And then Pilate says, well, what are are you the king of? And then Jesus points towards something higher, which he does so often in the scriptures. 
People ask him very basic questions and he always elevates the questions and the conversations. And that's what he does here. Jesus teaches that his kingdom is both material and immaterial. That which is visible and physical and that which is invisible and spiritual, meaning angels and demons, Christians and non-Christians, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, healthy and sick, living and the dead. And beyond all of that, Jesus desires to be king of our hearts, too. See, a lot of people th like to think they can have a personal life as like a side hustle on the side of their relationship with Jesus. In other words, they give most of their life to God, but there are some parts of their life that they're just not really willing to surrender. They want to keep those parts to themselves. And the problem is, until we give God everything, and make God and Jesus the king of our hearts, then we will never be living fully alive. Because we were created with a purpose in mind. We were created with a place in God's kingdom. And until we recognize that and surrender our lives to Jesus as our great high king, we will never be fully alive. So we've covered some uh, deep theological issues that there's so much more could be said about Jesus being the Son of God. Um, but here's the problem. A, a lot of us tend to accept Jesus in some of these anointed roles in our lives, but not all of them. So let's look at those. If we accept Jesus, first of all, as prophet and king, but we don't recognize him as priest. The resulting faith that comes from this type of thinking is viewing God as, or Jesus as someone who's sitting on a high throne so far away just looking down at us and pointing out all of the flaws in our lives. We, we tend to get this legalistic view of God where he's not as much concerned with knowing us or loving us, but he's much more concerned with us doing the right things. Or, or let's say if we look at another form of this faith, if we look at Jesus as our prophet and priest, but not our king. This type of faith results in, yeah, we recognize Jesus wants to point us towards something better. We recognize that as our priest, Jesus intimately knows us and loves us, but we're not really ready to surrender everything. We're not really ready to give him everything. These people, or, or this type of faith, I should say, recognizes that uh, they still want control of their own life. They love the idea of Jesus. They love the idea of running from sin and all these things, but they still want control. It reminds me of, there used to be this bumper sticker that was around back in the day uh, that said, Jesus is my co-pilot. And, and the problem with that bumper sticker, if you have it on your car, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm, this isn't about you, you know, uh, just so you know, it's not personal. But my thought is, when you see Jesus as my co-pilot, that means I'm still at the wheel. But surrendering our lives to Jesus as king means giving him control. Allowing him to direct us in the way we should go in this life. Allowing him to direct our steps like the book of Proverbs calls us to do. And we're just along for the ride. We say his word is true with this form of faith, but we'll follow it when it suits us on our own terms. So let's look at leaving out the third one then. If we look at Jesus as our priest and king, but not our prophet. The resulting faith of this is a faith that uh, is, is afraid of offending people or pointing out the sin in other people's lives. We view God as, man, we know he loves us. Man, we, we surrender ourselves to, to his kingship, his lordship, but we still think we know better than he does. We're still not ready for the smack on the back of the head we need sometimes when our life is going off the rails. We see a faith where if Jesus isn't seen as prophet, sinful beliefs and behaviors are seen as okay to, because to speak the truth and command repentance would require a prophetic voice. So let me ask you all a question this morning. I wonder if you consider these three roles Jesus plays in our lives, these anointed roles that Jesus personifies in the hearts of those who follow him. I wonder if you'd look at those three and think maybe to yourself, yeah, I've seen Jesus as my priest and king, but I don't know if I'm really allowing myself to, for, for, to be directed by Jesus as my prophet. 
I don't know if I really see myself turning from things that I know are wrong, that I know Jesus is telling me and showing me are wrong. Or I wonder if maybe you would view Jesus as your prophet and priest, but you're not really ready to give him everything as your king. I wonder if you find yourself in one of those places, or maybe for some of you, you've never even really thought about following Jesus or trusting Jesus with your life. And to all of us here this morning, I would say, the truth is, Jesus is God's only son. He came here to become our priest and to lovingly know us. Our every intimate thought is our priest. He came here to call us to turn from sin and turn towards something better as our prophet. And he came here to invite you into his kingdom, which is a kingdom of love, of hope, and of joy. So we're going to pray together in a moment here, and uh, I'm going to give an opportunity as a part of that prayer. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart before, I, I challenge you to take that first step today. To consider giving your life over to Jesus, trusting him with every part of who you are. And then we're also going to have a time to pray for those of us who find ourselves kind of embracing one or two of the anointed roles Jesus plays in our lives, but maybe tending to neglect the third, that we would give God everything this morning. Would you all pray with me? God, first and foremost, we want to start by thanking you for the healing you've done in Pastor Scott's life. God, I thank you for laying your healing touch on, on my brother, my friend, my mentor, my boss. Uh, I know there's so much more I, I personally have left to learn from him and his influence. So I want to start there just thanking you, God, for the healing you've done in his life. And God, secondly, I want to thank you for sending your son here to earth for us. I want, you, I want to thank you for sending Jesus as, as a prophet who could point us towards something better. I thank you, God, that we have a spiritual GPS in our hearts that can guide us towards what's always better, what's always higher, just like Jesus always did while he was on earth. I want to thank you, God, that our God is personal. We have Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who knows us personally and intimately and is interceding on our behalf to you. God, I want to thank you for inviting us to be a part of your kingdom. For allowing us to enter in to know what real love is and to show that and to drag as many people into your kingdom as we can. God, for those who've never taken that first step before of surrendering their life to Jesus, today might be the day. So God, for those people, I pray this morning that they would say something like, God, I, I, I accept you. Jesus Christ is your son. And God, today, I invite him into my heart to become my great prophet, priest, and king. Or maybe, God, for some of us who, who are struggling with certain aspects of who you are, who your son is, I pray today, God, that we would take one step, one practical step towards understanding and knowing you and knowing your son is our great prophet, priest, and king. God, we ask that you guide our steps this day and for all of our days. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.